Hi, everyone. It's Angie Hooper from Happy at Law. And today we're going to go a bit differently on the subject than we usually do. I want to talk to you today about how to hire a coach. Um, and the reason is, as I navigate between the legal profession and the coaching profession, I've noticed some things that I want to highlight for you so that if you are thinking about hiring a coach for your own career or engaging with someone to support your associates or other lawyers at your firm or your legal department, let's talk about how to find and hire the right expert to develop those associates and retain your star performers. So before we do that, we've really got to take a step back and talk about how we got here. Why is it that 2021 is the year that the legal profession has really focused in on attorney mental health and attorney emotional well, an em attorney emotional wellness? Um, this is a great thing for our profession to have this focus, and we're seeing different qualities and maybe different levels of programming out there as bar associations and individual lawyers kind of feel their way through how to grapple with alarming statistics in front of our profession right now. So let's take a step back and just talk about kind of how we got here. So you may remember that in 2016, the American Bar Association partnered with the Betty Ford Hazelden Clinic to do a study on lawyer substance abuse. They surveyed uh, 13,000 or so lawyers, practicing attorneys across several states, and they really found some alarming results. What they found was that a significant percentage of attorneys were engaging in problematic drinking behavior or problematic use of substances. A, an alarming percentage of practicing lawyers had symptoms of depression. An alarming percentage had symptoms of anxiety or multiple categories there, right? Some lawyers checked more than one box. And it was a wake-up call for the ABA and really a wake-up call for all of us in the profession. Um, these kinds of numbers represent real human suffering. And when you think about how important it is for our society, our environment, our economy, individuals, when you think about how important it is for all the stakeholders to have access to the right kind of legal services and competent legal professionals, it is foundational in our society and our economy for lawyers to do what they do. So a real, a real wake up call and really alarming. Um, and bar associations have started to respond. That's the good news. If you want to check out some of these study details for yourself, um, I will put a link in one of the comments um, so that you can check that out. But you can Google Hazelden, Betty Ford, and ABA, and you'll get there. So in Hazelden is H-A-Z-E-L-D-E-N um, when you Google that. And you'll find the study and some press releases about that. Another thing that's happened is that in 2020, coincidentally pre-pandemic, the ABA did another study. And the study was intended to look at lawyer student loan debt burdens. Um, and then again, the numbers are, are shocking and, and heartbreaking. But what I want to mention to you on this study, and you can Google that one as well, um, median law school debt. For those of you that have been out of law school for a while, like I have, uh, median law school debt for these new lawyers coming out of school, the ones who graduated in the last 10 years, is really shocking. Uh, median uh, law school debt coming out of law school is $160,000. Um, where I live in a mid-sized city in the middle of the country, you can get a house for that, right? Um, so these are significant amounts of money. And we're seeing that drive ripple effects through our entire industry that, that really could be a whole other, a whole other um, topic to talk about. 
what was really interesting about this study was that the student loan debt burden study did not originally ask about the effect of student loans on lawyer emotional health. But so many lawyers wrote in that their student loan burden was triggering their depression, that it was contributing to their anxiety and their stress level and their burnout. And so many lawyers wrote in answers that they had changed their career dreams based on the burden of their student loans, that the mental health answer to some of these questions was statistically significant as a write-in option, that it is included in those study results. So if you are in a position where you are a uh, you are in law firm management or you're in legal department management, you need to know about this because this economic burden is really driving lawyer behavior, and and you're going to see that as you consume legal services um, or as you provide legal services. So the other thing that has contributed to us getting here and finally having these conversations are some of these bar association initiatives, and well-meaning folks are finally starting to get attention, right? So these um, lawyer helpline or lawyer um, uh, lawyer support lines from bar associations are starting to get the attention that this really deserves. And you'll see yoga for lawyers. You'll see, you're seeing now CLEs on imposter syndrome for lawyers, um, stress management for lawyers. And um, my observation as somebody who has a foot in both professions is that the quality varies, but the intentions behind these things are really valuable. And we are starting to have the conversation. So I love that. Um, the other thing that's happening right now, another influence on all of this is a highly competitive lateral market. Um, Law firms, especially the big law firms, had a huge year over the past couple of years. Um, we've had a lot of um, upheaval generally, and we've got a, a hot employee side market for, um, for all kinds of, of roles. And so that competition for lateral hires and new hires is going to continue to be a stressor and an incentive for law firms and legal departments to deal with these issues. The next one on the list here may not have occurred to you as a factor, but we've got to talk about the effect of alternative legal service providers on the future of the profession and the goals and success alongside happiness for lawyers. And I, I can't really convey this strongly enough. This is an existential threat to the profession, right? Now, that being said, I actually think it's a good thing because, um, and again, this is a whole topic for another training, but when you think about these alternative legal service providers, um, in the last few days, uh, LegalZoom has been approved as, a, as, a, as an alternative legal service provider in Arizona right? So that's your bellwether event. That is the thin, well, not even the thin end of the wedge. That is the, the first event in what's going to be multi-jurisdictional practice, right? This company is a publicly traded company. So you're going to start seeing AMLAW 100 big law firms start looking into IPOs, right? This is a transformational impact on our profession and the legal services industry. And I think there's some good things that are going to happen from it, but it's going to be for a lot of law firms and lawyers, terrifying, right? So people, individuals are going to have to figure out how to adapt in that context and how to deal with their own fear and uncertainty, right? So we've got that factor coming into play. Also in 2020, with all the shutdowns and, um, and the continuation of, of as people are figuring out how to get back to work in person, the work from home movement and navigating the return to normalcy have created unprecedented levels of personal stress and complexity for people's lives. And if we leave them without the right kinds of resources and tools, they're going to struggle unnecessarily. That's going to affect their productivity, perhaps even affecting their ability 
to stay in the profession and continue to do good, to do good work. Um, and the, the last one on the list here, diversity and inclusion initiatives that continue to fizzle out. So we could have a whole, a whole discussion on this one as well, but my suggestion to you today is to start looking at those DNI initiatives as a symptom of the way that we train professionals to step into the legal profession, right? The way that we across the profession, across all categories tend to sort of in the past, throw folks into the deep end and they sink or they swim. And, you know, and that's the career you had, right? So the hidden key to really moving the needle on these diversity and inclusion initiatives is to give all of your lawyers access to the tools and those professional development, emotional skill set, mental health skill set to stay in the profession and give them the basis to thrive in the profession, to have the life and the career that they want, rather than having to feel like they have to choose between those things, right? Um, and so that's kind of how we got where we are. So there's some good things happening and some, some, you know, new things happening. But when we look at the environment that lawyers are operating in right now, it's new. Um, we have a, we have seismic, <laughs> we have seismic forces at work, right? Okay. Um, if you guys aren't totally familiar with my background. Um, I'm Angie Hooper from Happy at Law, and I spent 22 years on the front lines, private practice and corporate legal departments at publicly traded companies. Um, and those were, those were companies in heavy manufacturing, energy, you know, oil field services, equipment, that kind of stuff, right? Um, not for the faint of heart. And through some really historic events, um, which if you've seen some of our other free trainings, you might, um, you might have heard those stories as well. But now I show other lawyers how to build their success and live their dream, live the life that they wanted to have, that they dreamed about when they decided to go to law school, right? And we do that through the practice of law. So that's what I do. And as I speak to you guys individually as clients and, and through various channels, um, and as I observe the changes in the coaching industry over the past couple of years, right? Like we had a lot of folks who just woke up one day in 2020 and were like, hey, I think I'll be a life coach, right? Um, so I think it's really helpful if you are considering engaging coaching resources for your attorneys at your firm or your department that you have a good basis for understanding what's out there in the market and how to navigate these different types of services. Um, it's really fashionable right now to describe everything as coaching. And I'm not sure why that is, but that's the fashionable term right now. So things that are actually in one of these other categories you see on the slide, um, therapy, consulting, mentoring, friendship, um, general advice. Those are different categories of services and resources, um, but they're not coaching. So let's talk about what these other things are, and then we'll talk about how coaching is different. And that'll give you a basis to start deciding what kind of services and resources will support your team in the best way and how to kind of start navigating through um, what's out there in the market. So therapy is really so mainstream right now um, and, and geared towards, and so helpful for many people, it's really geared towards identifying and resolving those past deep-seated emotional trauma or problems. Um, therapy is really focused on exploring the past to understand the present or really focused on managing a, a mental illness that's been diagnosed. So the goal of therapy is to take someone who's in a dysfunctional place, 
um, having trouble getting out of bed because they've got depression that needs to be managed, for instance. So taking someone from a dysfunctional place to a functional place. Does that make sense? Consulting is different. There's a lot of folks out there that are doing consulting that are calling themselves coaches. So I want you to have this definition and you can, you'll start to see the difference. So consultants go into a situation and they analyze the situation to make a recommendation for changes or to analyze the situation and provide an answer to a question. And the classic scenario for this is consulting in the business context where some Someone comes in and looks at your billing needs and makes a recommendation for e-billing software, right? They come in, they analyze, they give you a solution. Um, a lot of times consultants will come in with preferred solutions. Um, so they may have a they may have an agenda that they come to the party with. And that's important to know um, because the consultant will often have a goal of implementing their agenda to solve the client's problem. And you see this a lot with um, outsourced services providers, right? So if you've got an IT company that's going to come in and um, solve your networking issues, right? They're going to be more likely to recommend to you the solution that uses the equipment and software that they implement and that they're familiar with, right? It just kind of makes sense. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just that agenda-based solution is important to be able to recognize. A mentoring gets a bad rap because um, we think of it as a free thing, like a volunteer thing that's supposed to happen. Um, and there are a lot of folks who are providing a service that they are describing as coaching, but it's really professional mentoring. I think professional mentoring can be an amazing solution for people. It's based on a role model type relationship, right? Um, so you'll see that the mentor has had a problem in the past that's similar to the one that the client is experiencing and they're offering to teach the client their solution. So you'll see this a lot in the weight loss space, right? You'll see someone come in and say, I, um, you know, I had, I had this situation, I had this going on with my body and I started eating in this way and then everything got better. And here's, here's my plan for you to follow that same plan. Right. Does that make sense? So a lot of mentors, um, even if they're referring to themselves as coaches, because that's the fashionable term are going to be saying something to the effect of, I had your problem. I solved it this way. Do it like I did it. And I'll show you how that's, that's kind of how the, the progress, the progress of that will go. Um, and they will often, um, be a, in a good place to help if there's a specific problem that tends to have a specific solution that works for a broad number of people in the same way. Now, you may think friendship is kind of an interesting thing to have on this list, right? But there are people out there and some of these folks who woke up one day in 2020 and decided to be a coach did so because they were actually thinking, oh, well, my friends always come to me for advice, right? Um, and you may have a friend like this. Friends like this are really great. You you go for coffee with them and they're a great listener and they always tell you what to do and it tends to work out for you, right? Um, and somebody who is a great listener, I'm telling you, is worth their weight in gold, right? Because we don't do enough of that these days. But the thing about a friend or a friendship style um, coaching, put that in quotes, person who's coaching with that friendship style is that they show up with their own agenda, right? They show up with their own beliefs and experience that the way the world looks and feels to them is the way it looks and feels to everybody. So there are usually big blind spots with a friendship model based on that person's point of view, right? And this one, we've all experienced that time where you thought you were just sharing something that happened that day with someone you know, suddenly you get all this unsolicited advice, right? Um, and maybe it just felt kind of yucky and judgy, even if your friend had good intentions. So 
the marker there is the unsolicited advice. And true professional coaching is not advice giving, right? True professional coaching is going to be based on specific tools to uncover the client's best strategy for the client's goals, right? And in particular, the way we do it at Happy at Law, we we base our approach on uh, mental, emotional, values-based strategies to support our clients in building towards elite performance. So that's how it that's how those things differ from coaching. So let's talk about what it is, right? So coaching is expert support to build the life based on your goals and your definition of success that you want, right? Professional coaches don't show up with an agenda for you to believe or have a certain goal or believe a certain thing, right? Um, and the International Coaching Federation, which is kind of the gold standard, defines coaching as partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential. The process of coaching often unlocks previously untapped sources of imagination, productivity, and leadership. So that's a definition of coaching that is the broadest sense of what professional coaches do. So if we take this to the executive coaching context or the professional, um, especially in the legal profession or those, those compliance-based roles where you're in a high stress, high stakes environment a lot of the time. When you think about this definition, what the coach is helping you to do or could help you do <clears throat> is to begin to identify those areas where you are called to be or do a certain task or to be or take a certain position in the context of your professional life, and there's some thing in the way. It might show up as procrastination or waking up at two in the morning, worrying about whether you sent the email, right? It might show up as dreading calling the client to share an update, right? It might show up as a physical symptom, like your hair starting to fall out from the stress and you you know, you look around and, and everybody seems stressed out. So you think that's normal. Um, so those are the types of ways that we would take this ICF coaching definition and really bring it into the lawyer context, because the data is clear. Lawyers are struggling, right? Such high levels of stress, such high levels of emotional distress, and it can be different. Um, it, it is it is just heartbreaking to see people struggle. And maybe you know somebody who is struggling with this. And we have the strategies and tools to help folks move out of that and have the life and the career that they want. So if you are looking at um, that type of thing, here's how we do it at Happy at Law. Um, we, we put our clients through a process where we assess their, their energy leadership. We do a particular assessment on that to kick everybody off. We work with them to define what's important to them. We start with really detailed look at core values and their characteristics. We show them how to start rebuilding their dream, the dream that they had for the life and the success that they wanted, right? Because a lot of us get to a point in our legal career where we think we can't do it. We think we can't have a life and the success we want, right? So we, we oftentimes with people have to take that step back to help them begin to recreate that dream of if they could have what they wanted, what would it look like, right? Because we forget, we, we make ourselves forget. It's too painful when we think it's unattainable, right? And then we start looking at setting those core goals and building the tools around that to help them achieve that goal and make progress towards the life that they want and the career that they want. You see how that works? So we use our core dynamics performance tools to equip lawyers to have that elite performance, right? And to build that happiness and comfort and, and 
move them away from stress and burnout so that they can be more productive and stay in the profession for a lifetime, right? Practicing law ought to be the adventure of a lifetime. And for so many lawyers, it's just not. Um, so let's talk about if, if you're in a position where you want to start looking at tools for your lawyers. Um, here, here's my recommendation for how to choose a coach or those kinds of supports um, for yourself or for lawyers at your firm. And you're going to recognize some of these bullet points because it's kind of like choosing a lawyer, right? There are a lot of lawyers out there and lawyers have different specialties. They have different backgrounds, different training. Um, the the sim similar um, process comes into play when you're thinking about how to choose a coach. So you do want to look at formal training, right? Um, there are some great coaches out there that have less formal training and there are some mediocre coaches that have a lot of formal training, but for the most part, having had formal training um, and some certification in a coaching method is a great way as a, as a first pass to start looking at whether it's somebody you want to work with. Um, and there are, there are a couple out there that are a good indicator that somebody is going to be able to be a good supportive coach for you. There are a couple of coaching credentials that you're going to want to look at. Um, the Institute for Professional Excellence and Coaching, IPEC, has a certified professional coach credential and an Energy Leadership Index Master Practitioner credential, along with a Core Performance Dynamics Specialist credential. Um, those are the ones I have. International Coaching Federation has um, a couple of certifications that um, that they uh, award to people and renew on an annual basis based on number of hours of professional coaching that someone has done and and filed with the ICF. So that can be a way to start to cut through some of the noise. When you're in a specialized niche like practicing law, you may want to look at familiarity with the industry. Um, now, there are great coaches that can coach lots of diff lots of people in lots of situations. Um, and so for here, you're going to want to look at your experience as a lawyer who provides a high level of service as a lawyer and how you look at, um, for instance, if you've got litigators who focus on an industry segment, right? Um, I remember one time I was, when I was in-house at a, at a company that had, um, a fleet of private jets. That sounds so fancy when I say it like that. Um, but we had a need to find an expert who could help us with, with a very, very arcane piece of aviation law. And we searched high and low for these folks because we had lots of good law firms with lots of good lawyers who could have gone out and done research on it. But we were really looking for somebody who had that industry familiarity who could advise us on maybe some real world application, right? Like you've seen that in your own practice. So that's something to consider when you're looking at how to choose a coach for yourself or for your firm to, to work with your associates and colleagues. Coaching style is going to be really important, and this will be related to credentials. So for instance, there is a humongous billion dollar coaching company um, that certifies coaches in their style. And my personal experience with them was that their coaching style was very directive and kind of bossy. <laughs> And it wasn't a style that worked for me personally. So I don't recommend for people who ask me, I don't recommend that um, coaches from that certification program as a general rule. I have met some great coaches from that program, but for the most part, they tend to be a bit more directive and a bit more advice driven than coaches from other um 
modalities that I think work better for lawyers who don't like being bossed around, if that makes sense. Um, so you want to look at coaching style. Uh, and, and this will also, when you look at coaching style, this will tell you whether you're dealing with a professional coach or whether you're dealing with a consultant or whether you're dealing with a mentor, right? Because a mentor, because the mentor comes to you and says, I'm your role model, do it like I did it. They're going to be much more directive in telling you how to implement what they're advising than somebody who says, okay, we have a common goal here for you to maintain or build your success and live the life of your dreams. Let's dig in and talk about what that looks like for you in the context of your personality, your family, your dream for the future, right? Maybe, maybe you've got a, a romantic relationship. You've got a sweetie that's a, it's a high priority for you, or maybe you don't. And finding that is a high priority for you, right? So certain types of advice, certain direct directives might not fit that dream as well as it might fit somebody who was like, Hey, I got five years where I'm not going to do anything but practice law because I think that's a way for me to do that, right? So, so for them, the goals might be more around achievement and getting certain types of work, right? So we would treat those very differently based on the client goals. Um, so coaching style is going to have a big impact on your experience of the process, whether you want somebody to tell you what to do or whether you want somebody to figure out your best answer because your best answers inside of you. Do you see how that works? And that brings us to the outcome, right? So you've got to think about what's the outcome that you want. Is your outcome more of a metric based? I want to make more money or I want to, um, you know, get a certain promotion. And so I want to set myself up to, to be at, to be performing at my best while I go for that. Or is the outcome you want more, um, intangible, right? Is it more satisfaction driven? Is it more about um, being in the present and enjoying your life now instead of waiting for a milestone in the future, right? So when you're honest with yourself about that, it'll help you decide what you want. Um, this will This will also help you to sort out what you want from your coach. Do you want something that's very worksheet driven? Do you want something that's very spiritually based? Are you really looking for more of a, more of an esoteric life purpose kind of situation? Um, is what you're looking for more HR focused? You know, are you looking for somebody to do personality testing or are you looking for something that's more internal, internally driven, right? Do you want that more customized experience? Um, and you want to think about how you want to buy services. Now, this is where your experience as a lawyer is really going to help you because um, there are a lot of coaches out there who don't charge very much for an, a 50 minute session. Um, and generally speaking, you will get what you pay for with coaching, um, which sounds a little harsh, but um, and of course there are going to be outliers, but generally speaking, that's going to be how it works. And it kind of reminds me, oh, this is like not, it's such a sad story, actually. I don't know if I want to tell it, but, um, but I started, so I will. Um, it reminds me of, um, someone that I used to work with who came to me asking for a recommendation for, um, a lawyer for a custody situation. And, I recommended to him an amazing lawyer who had not just the um, family law expertise, but also had experience with exactly the kind of situation that was in play. And um, they went to the lawyer and had a consultation and said, oh, it's too expensive. The hourly rate's too high. And decided to go with a different lawyer who was a hundred bucks cheaper an hour who, you know, you've already guessed how the story is going to turn out, took way too long to do everything um, and actually kind of effed up the case. Right. Um, didn't get a <laughs> didn't get a jurisdictional question. I mean, it was just it was a train wreck. It was so hard to watch. But here's the thing. The original goal had been to had been budget driven. 
And they ended up spending thousands and thousands more than they would have if they paid a little more by the hour and gotten it resolved sooner, right? So not every situation is going to go down that awful path, but it is something to keep in mind, right? How do you want to buy services? Do you want a discrete program that's going to take you through a process where you're going to, you're going to go for the outcome that you want, or are you wanting more of a package or do you just want to kind of onesie twosie buy time with a coach and, and what, and how do you want to, how do you want to pay for that? And then the last one on this list might actually be the best, the, the most important one, right? Because at the end of the day, if the personality and the fit are not right, then you're not going to have the experience that you want working with somebody, right? So when you engage in professional coaching, some stuff is going to come up. Even if you are totally focused in on, I just want to work on my procrastination and understand how to stop doing that through the process of uncovering why you keep procrastinating and what's going on there and unpacking it to change it, some stuff is going to come up, some human stuff, right? That's just inevitable. If you want to really get to the root cause and resolve the issue, that human stuff is going to come up and you want to feel comfortable and safe sharing what you're going to need to share, right? So personality and fit are a big deal. And listen, when we do um, uh, our intake calls, when we do our strategy calls with, with folks who reach out to work with us, um, we don't invite everybody to work with us. If we get on the phone and, and usually these calls are about 45 minutes, if we get on the phone with somebody and we talk to them about what's working and not what's not working and, and what their goals are and what their dream is. If we go through that process with them and I don't think that our solution is the right solution for them, I recommend something else. Or I invite them to schedule another call at a time when, when they might be ready, right? Because it does neither of us any good to have a bad fit in that relationship. So it's, really important to get that one right. All right. So why would you want to engage after all of that? Why would you want to engage somebody? Right. And here's why, um, the world has changed around us, right? It's always changing around us, but the last couple of years, it's been really in our faces that, that things have been changing. Just the transformation from working remotely over the past 18 to 24 months has been a game changer. We are all rediscovering new ways to have relationships with our clients and our work colleagues just because of geography, right? So working from home has been such a fundamental shift in how we think about work versus the rest of our lives. We're still feeling the effects of that, right? And all the fallout from it the personal relationships that were stressed to the breaking point, the, the work relationships that had to be renegotiated, right? So you want a way to encourage productivity and help lawyers integrate their practice into their lives. You see how that works? Here's the other thing. Um, happier lawyers are more productive. If you need a business case for your firm or for your department, Happier lawyers are more productive. And, you know, it's funny, there's actually some, um, there's some data around this that comes from a study of office workers at British Telecom in the 90s, where they found that office employees who, in, who reported feeling happier were 13% more productive than those who didn't. So can you imagine getting 13% more productivity out of one of your lawyers, right? Imagine if one of your top performers could get 13% more productive. Wouldn't that be crazy? That'd be awesome. Um, we already talked about um, coaching and, and success tools as success tools as a way to um, move the needle on diversity and inclusion. Um, 
what we've done in the past for diversity and inclusion, just these, these programs aren't working. Um, and we need to start rethinking how to approach that and give people the personal tools, the resilience and the courage um, to help them navigate a difficult profession. We know that we lose diverse lawyers at the three to five year mark and at the 20 year mark, especially with your senior female attorneys your experts who have become so valuable to your firm, we know that you're at risk at losing them at about the 20 year mark. And um, the, some of the speculation around this is that after about 20 years, you've got female lawyers who have sort of done all the things they were asked to do, right? They did all the things that they were asked to do. They worked hard. They got the degree. They studied. They got the grades. They got the clients. They build the hours. And now they're still not happy, right? And it takes them about 20 years to sort of have tried everything and try and be the person everybody told them, oh, if you just do all the right things, it'll all work out and you'll be happy then. And they get to about year 20 and they still aren't happy, right? And they've watched their life go by. So if you can give that lawyer the right kind of support to re-engage with their passion for life and the practice, then you can keep them in the profession and you can keep their expertise, right? So you're going to retain your top performers when you do that. At the other end of the spectrum, we've got to acknowledge as a profession that we stink at training lawyers, right? Like, can you imagine if lawyers were trained like doctors, you know, if, if your second year of law school or your, you know, fall of your third year of law school, people came to you and said, we think you're amazing. We want to train you. We want to bring you under our wing and, and, you know, let you rotate through different practice areas and try things out. And we're going to be there with you every step of the way, which is what I imagine being a, a medical student is like, <laughs> probably get some medical students to argue with that. But um, from observing it from the outside, that seems to be how it goes. But we don't train lawyers that way, right? We, we have them compete, you know, to the death all through law school. And then we sort of throw them in the deep end to see who survives. It's crazy. It's, so we've got to be better as a profession at training associates to be professionals. And when I say that, I don't mean legal knowledge. I'm not talking about legal expertise. I'm talking about the ability to speak up in a meeting. I'm talking about the ability to engage with a client and ask all those questions that need to be asked to get the full picture, like what's really going on here, right? when you start training your associates to have the internal courage and resilience to persevere, right? You are training them up to have the professional demeanor and the professional emotional and mental attributes to be successful and to enjoy practicing law, right? That's going to be a game changer for you because nobody's doing that right now, right? And if you do that, you're going to differentiate yourself in recruiting. You will be a level above the other firms and departments you're competing with for talent because the candidates will see that you care about them as an entire person, right? That you care that they develop into the person, into the professional legal provider that they want to be, that they didn't learn how to be in law school, right? Like in law school, they taught us black letter law. They taught us a strategy for thinking a certain way. They taught us how to analyze and compete and be successful in that way. They didn't teach us how to be lawyers, right? We have to sort of pick that up when we graduate. We got we to gotta learn it from doing, but we could be much more intentional about supporting our newer lawyers and associates in their professional development and set them up for success, right? See how that works? And here's the thing, um, you know, millennials, right? The stats are in on this too. And millennials 
have said over and over again, they will give up money and status to have their life now, to enjoy their lives now. They keep telling us this. And at some point as a profession, we've got to learn how to respond and providing professional coaching for these more junior lawyers or these folks who are in the profession um, who, who have that mindset is going to be critical for you to continue to grow and develop your talent base. So um, if we, I hope this was helpful to you. Um, I know there's a lot of confusion out there. A lot of folks running around calling themselves coaches or, uh, you know, and there's, a, there's a lot <laughs> out there. There's a lot that's really, really good. And there's a lot that looks crazy. So, um, I hope this was helpful context for you to begin to be able to see how to start differentiating between what can really be an incredibly valuable resource and tool and support for your practice and for your colleagues and associates. Um, you know, it, in my 22 years of practicing law, the, the game changer for me through corporate scandals, through 9-11, through um, personal crises, through company meltdowns, through all of it was having had the chance to learn the internal resilience and courage to be able to navigate those situations because you're never going to totally be prepared for the crazy thing that life is going to throw at you. But you can absolutely learn the tools and strategies from the right kind of coaching to move through it with grace and peace and the knowledge that you're in exactly the right place, living your purpose, doing what you need to be doing and building success at the same time. I mean, that's that's my dream for you. That was the career that I had. That's my dream for every lawyer. Um, so if that sounds like something that would be helpful to you or one of your colleagues, um, send us an email. You can reach us at hello at happyatlaw.com if you have any questions or you want to talk more about any of this. If you want to book that free strategy session to talk about whether it's a fit for us to work on this together, then you can go to angiehooper.com forward slash apply. That takes you straight into my calendar. Pick the time that works for you and let's get on the phone and talk about it. Um, we'd love to help you. This is my privilege and my passion to give back to the profession in this way and to help other lawyers have an amazing career like I had. So Thank you guys for your time today and for hanging in here. And I hope that you have an amazing rest of the day.